We begin with the forms of despair. Despair is a disunity of the self. Many times we live our lives without any focus. We simply exist without any self-reflection. This is what Kierkegaard calls immediacy. Uh, our heart, our mind, our soul are not operating uh, with the same goal in mind, and yet we go through life unconcerned. Um, if you want to follow this, this is on page 345. The more we realize or are conscious that we are a self, the intensity of the despair increases. Kierkegaard tells us that the maximum of despair is what he calls defiance of despair, and the minimum of despair is when we're not even aware of our despair. The first form that we'll talk about is called the despair which is unconscious that it is despair or the despairing unconsciousness of having a self and an eternal self. Sometimes these titles are a little cryptic, but I think as we go through explaining each one, I think it'll become more apparent. Here, a person is in despair, but they're unconscious of it. They're not even conscious of being a self. We'll find there's a relationship. The more conscious a person is of being a self, well, the more conscious they will be of being in despair. So when a man is supposed to be happy, Kierkegaard says, he imagines that he is happy, whereas viewed in the light of the truth, he is unhappy. And in this case, he is generally very far from wishing to be torn away from that delusion. Many who are unconscious of their despair appear to be happy because they're under a delusion of the self. This man isn't worried about seeking truth, but is more concerned with his own entertainment, his own pleasure. They enjoy feeling good and being happy. They want to play with their toys. They don't want to be distracted uh, from this life of frivolity and fun. I think we know many people that are in that state. They have no concept of the eternal self. To think about oneself as they truly are before God is far too fearful of a thought and would certainly disrupt their sense of happiness. They have no problem being under a delusion. As a matter of course, they prefer it and even seek out after delusion for it preserves their imitation of a self. Whether or not he's aware of despair He's still in despair. So despair isn't always what we think it is. It isn't always depression. We may talk about that a little later, uh, but it can be depression. Uh, sometimes despair has no external signs, not only that the self can see, but that others might see as well. So despair is a lot more difficult to analyze than uh, depression. The despairing man who is unconscious of being in despair is, in comparison with him who is conscious of it, merely a negative step further from the truth and from salvation. In order to reach the truth, one must be willing to first face his own truth. In order for this to take place, one must stand before that which is truth, God. And we'll hear more about this later. Being unaware of our despair is certainly more dangerous than being aware of it, since it's further from the truth. He is as a man who does not go to the doctor because he fears finding out he has a sickness. He hides from the truth as though not knowing it will save him. By the time he does go, it may be too late to be healed. It's people who put off this reflection, this self-reflection. Being conscious of oneself as spirit means consciousness of his eternal being or his eternal self. And it's positive step towards becoming a unified or a true self 
But as we will find out, one must follow through with this or else remain in despair. So when we become conscious of our self, conscious that we exist as a spirit, we then become conscious of our eternal being and our eternal self. And this is a positive step towards the healing process. So not only do we find this in paganism, but it's also found in Christianity. And we'll see as we continue that even though he's writing about people, I see this as going beyond the individual into the corporate church where many are unconscious of their own despair. And in a sense, the church as a whole may be unconscious of its own despair. They're simply saying, leave us alone. We're having a good time here. We're playing great music. We're having picnics, barbecues. We even have some rituals here that make us feel religious. So don't start talking about the resurrection of Christ and that pesky Sermon on the Mount and other serious things. That will bring us down from our happy place to a more serious level uh, where I might realize that I have a deep spiritual problem. Every human existence which is not conscious of itself as spirit or conscious of itself before God as spirit Every human existence which is not thus grounded transparently in God, but obscurely reposes or terminates in some abstract universality, such as a state or a nation, etc., every such existence is, after all, despair. So he tells us here that every individual must see himself grounded transparently in God or in truth. We must not focus on ourselves here, but upon God. Our presence is overshadowed by the presence of God. We see God and not ourselves without any abstractions such as the ones listed. This is the whole centrality of Kierkegaard's remedy or his answer to despair. Now the pagan lacked the spirit's definition of the self. Therefore, he expressed such a judgment of self-slaughter, which is suicide. And this, the same pagan did, who condemned with moral severity theft, unchastity, etc. He lacked the God relationship and the self. So what he's telling us here is that uh, being pagan did not mean that they were immoral people. They simply lacked a relationship with God. I mean, we can also have an idea of ethics, but still not stand before God. I know many people have replaced God with some system of ethics. Ethics can be thought of in the same way that we think of the Ten Commandments. They give us insight into God's righteousness and into our own sinfulness. They make us aware that we're incomplete and imperfect as we stand alone. In other words, the difference between the pagan outside Christianity and, in a sense, the one inside it, is that the pagan in Christianity is going in a negative direction since he was closer to the truth and now falls further from it. And the pagan outside Christianity, however, was not, uh, who has not seen the truth and has a better chance at becoming uh, into it since he is not rejecting it but is merely ignorant of it. So one who knows the truth has been, has heard the truth and is in the process of rejecting it is a pagan in Christianity who rejects it. But a pagan outside Christianity who has not yet heard the truth has a much better chance because he hasn't yet rejected it. He still has an opportunity to accept it as it becomes more, he becomes more conscious of himself. And now we move on to another despair. The despair, which is conscious of being despair, but also it is conscious of being a self wherein there is, after all, something eternal. And then is either in despair at not willing to be itself or in despair at willing to be itself. At first, this looks like something impenetrable. One of those statements Kierkegaard makes, as we've read before. Uh, in this despair, however, they're conscious that their spirit is disunity. 
So a person comes about and they're conscious of this disunity in their life. They're also conscious of being a self. Therefore, they're conscious of some kind of eternality about their spirit. Remember, the more conscious we are of our self, the more conscious we are of our eternity, eternality. But they're in despair because either they're not willing to be itself in this state, or they're in despair because they are willing to be itself. Now, this seems to be confusing since it appears that they're damned if they do and damned if they don't. But let's take a closer look. That's not exactly how this plays out. So let's continue to see if Kierkegaard can clear this up for us. So this is, does this person really know what despair is? Uh, so he may be in despair, but it may be a false despair, or at least a false understanding of it. His true despair goes much deeper than what he really thinks. Does knowing that was that one is in despair help at bringing him out of despair? Well, Kierkegaard right here anyway is not going to give us that answer. Uh, and he continues on to say, at one moment it has almost become clear to him that he is in despair. But then at another moment it appears to him after all as though his indisposition might have another ground, as though it were the consequence of something external, something outside himself. And that if this were to be changed, he would not be in despair, or perhaps by diversions or in other ways, for example, by work and busy occupations as a means of distraction, he seeks by his own effort to preserve an obscurity about his condition. Again, might seem a little cryptic at first, but if we read it several times and read it slowly, uh, I think what we'll do is glean from it this idea. In other words, a person might think that if the external cause or changed or removed, everything would be okay. So he sees his despair, none as something internal, none as something spiritual, not a disunity of spirit, but he sees it as something caused by some external cause. And if only that external cause were changed, he'd be fine. They see the problem of their despair as something caused by something outside himself. Sometimes in despair, a person might hide from it. They could become excessively busy to the point that they lose themselves. Sports, watching TV, etc. If something becomes obsessive, it probably is showing some kind of despair. So the person runs away from this sense of despair. He thinks he, be he can become lost in some manner. Now, Kierkegaard talks about this as becoming a member of the team or the family or the nation. Uh, this way one loses himself. Many companies, at least in my generation, went in this direction to kind of make you feel like you were part of a family, the corporate family. Uh, and, and they can play that role in a person's life. And... Uh, they can be very successful in convincing people that their reality is their work, their job, not their family and not their own activities. It's a form of using this, a running away from the self for corporate gain. Such an obscurity is welcomed by the one in despair because it removes the sense of being in despair. He does not see it as obscurity, but as, uh, but as really believes he is a member of this team or family. He takes this upon himself as his identity. And this is the power also of the cults who make a person believe that they're really part of something greater than themselves and only have value within this group. And people run towards this, 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 uh, this uh, false sense of being an individual or being a self because it's not truly who they are. So this is also a form of running away. And this is a form of how religious groups use this uh, 
disunity of spirit, as Kierkegaard talks about it, to uh, create even more followers. But as was pointed out above, the degree of consciousness potentiates despair. In the same degree that a man has a truer conception of despair while still remaining in it, and in the same degree that he is more conscious of being in despair, in that same degree is his despair more intense. Consciousness then of despair is what gives it power. The more aware we are uh, of our despair, the more power it has. And this is the, the kind of the, the reciprocal relationship that we have with despair. The more we become aware of it, the more powerful it becomes in our life. Uh, but the opposite of being in despair is believing. Hence, we may perceive the justification for what was started above as the formula which describes a condition in which no despair at all exists. For this same formula is also the formula for believing. By relating itself to its own self and by willing to be itself, the self is grounded transparently in the power which constituted it. So here is where Kierkegaard once again gives us the solution may not be too clear, but we will kind of purge out what Kierkegaard is getting at. The only place where we can't exist without, or where we can exist without despair is in faith, by believing. Here, we relate the self to itself and will to be that self while it is transparently grounded in God. It is faith that gives us this potential, this quality, this ability to be able to put ourselves in this position. It is not that we cease to become a self, but that we die to the self and focus upon God's self in Christ rather than upon our own self. Faith is the means by which we can place our trust in someone else. And we must be very careful to make sure that someone else is God and not simply a replacement for God. Otherwise, we really gain nothing other than displace our despair uh, a little differently. In despair at not willing to be oneself, the despair of weakness. So here, Kierkegaard gives us an, a, another form here of despair or actually a subset of one of the forms. It's being in despair at not willing or not wanting to be oneself. And this is called the despair of weakness. Despair over the earthly or over something earthly. Again, a, a subsection of this type of despair, of uh, this weakness of not wanting to be oneself. He takes it in the form here of the earthly. I take this to mean the things that we have in life, the material world, perhaps something as broad as anything that is not spiritual. He talks about passive despair as a despair where one does not have a consciousness of oneself or that he's in despair. It is not something that comes from without, but something that comes from within. Passive despair is a despair that comes from within ourself. Uh, and now, Kierkegaard is going to start using this term, the immediate man. And he really doesn't define it very clearly, but uh, I was able to find some more information about this in the Cambridge Companion to Kierkegaard, which is a, another reference book, uh, an excellent source of material. The immediate man, according to the Cambridge Companion to Kierkegaard, means to relate to something without mediation or reflection. He has a relationship to the external world without the mediation of reflection. So the immediate man, in a sense we could say, uh, is immediate related to the material world without any kind of reflection or any thought as to what the meaning of this is.
Since the man does not reflect upon himself, we may say that despair happens to him as a victim might see it. Man projects projects his despair, or rather blames it upon something external to himself. He sees it as a loss of some kind. This sense of loss is then expressed as despair. In case everything suddenly changes, everything in the outward circumstances, and the wish is fulfilled, then life enters into him again. Immediacy rises again, and he begins to live as fit as a fiddle. This man is not really experiencing despair, but his immediacy. It is the loss of the earthly or the external that is blamed. So it stands to reason that in his mind, if he could only regain that which was lost, that his despair would go away. So he's blaming his despair for being something external, something in the world, something materialistic. The loss of this materialism, whatever it is, is what causes his despair, so he thinks. He blames it on something outward, and then he is able to, uh, not through reflection, but through this sense of loss, believes that he's in despair. So it's a misplaced sense of despair, or the blame of despair. He never really came to know that he had no self, so therefore could not have truly felt despair. What he felt was his sense of loss, and although he might receive help of some kind, he'll never be a self under these conditions. Now, Kierkegaard's conclusion on this type of individual contains a bit of his humor and sarcasm, which he's, he's famous for, uh, but we have to be very alert for it and really watch out for it. But this is, this is a kind of one of those... Uh, little paragraphs here. He now acquires some little understanding of life. He learns to imitate the other men, noting how they manage to live, and so he too lives after a sort. In Christendom, he too is a Christian. He goes to church every Sunday, hears and understands the parson, yea, they understand one another. He dies, the parson introduces him into eternity for the price of ten dollars. I'm sure the price has gone up for that. But a self he was not, and a self he did not become. This form of despair is despair at not willing to be oneself, or still lower, despair at not willing to be a self, or lowest of all, despair at willing to be another than himself, wishing for a new self. And yet, such a despair, well, he, he really did not want to, uh, to be who he thought that he was, in other words. He wanted to be someone else, or he wanted to create a completely new person. But this new person would again be a false person. And yet, such a despair, whose only wish is this most crazy of all transformations, loves to think that this change might be accomplished as easily as changing a coat. For the immediate man does not recognize his self. He recognizes himself only by his dress. He recognizes, and here again appears the infinity comic trait, he recognizes that he has a self only by externals. So this is a man who is focused on his external existence. What, who he is, what he is, is all external. It's all a facade, we might say. He sees himself only through superficial existence or his cosmetic self. He cannot see his true self because he fails to want to be a true self. He denies being his self. He has no self-value. He becomes a true imitation of a man. He looks like a man, talks like a man, but he is not truly a man. What if I were to become another? Or to get myself a new self. He sees his solution not as becoming himself, but who he truly is and was designed to be, but as becoming another self. Kierkegaard then picks up the idea of immediacy again. Immediacy is something that comes directly to us without reflection. Uh, 
as to its importance or influence upon us. Here the individual assumes to have self-reflection. Kierkegaard says this is a form of passive despair and not wanting to be oneself. He also calls it despair of weakness. The despair which the individual thinks is external is not always something that is obviously external such as a physical event, but comes by means of a memory or a reflection that happens within us. So it, it, it doesn't have to be something that we can touch or see, uh, but something that's in our mind. It could be a memory that we wish to go back in time to become someone else uh, or an event that we relate ourselves to. And when we realize that we are really separate from our environment as a self, we realize that things can happen to us that are outside us. And this is somewhat like what happened to Adam prior to or in accord with sin. When we realize our isolation from God and we realize that we are in fact a separate self and we are separate from our environment, we realize our uh, what would we, vulnerability and we also may become aware of our sin. When a man begins to reflect upon himself and decides to accept this self, will stumble upon a difficulty since no one is perfect. So a man may say, okay, I'm going to be myself. But as he begins to reflect, he sees imperfections in himself. He begins to stumble over these imperfections. He'll see his imperfections and this frightens him away. For some self-reflection is fine until it reveals some imperfection in himself. He makes an effort, but it's a passive effort. He still has the sense of being a victim. Such reflection can be quite fearful when we begin to see ourselves without the cosmetic coverings that we have used to prevent our real self from being seen. So when we finally begin to penetrate this cosmetic self, it's very fearful, and in, a ca in many cases, it prevents people from continuing. What this one sees may be just too overwhelming. The price to find his true self and break from immediacy is far too great. His despair is at not willing to be himself, which requires this break. So he sees what he has to become, what he has to get through to see his true self, and he decides this is too fearful, too overwhelming. He decides not to be a self. It's weakness on his part. It's something that he hopes that is going to pass, but it will not go away. And this is a difficulty with who he is, and he cannot overcome it. He does not want to be this self, hoping perhaps that things might change uh, eventually, maybe he'll become a better self on its own. It's not going to happen. He thinks that maybe this is who he is right now, but this might pass. And maybe he'll become someone better uh, later. And when this change takes place, then he'll be able to accept himself. He continues to evaluate himself, hoping that this change will take place. And after many attempts, he may decide that this is his self, and it will not change. Now, under these conditions, he may accept himself, but only that part of himself excluding his difficulty. He sort of wishes it away by ignoring it. But this is not truly himself, but only a deception of himself. This is not who he really is, but a false imitation of himself. In Christendom, he would be called a Christian. He talks about having been in despair and having conquered it, but the reality is that he is in despair because he is being deceived. Now, this is a common form of despair. Most men will blame their despair on something external and do not go very deep into themselves and are satisfied with the self-deception of themselves. And I know that I've said men here, uh, being gender conscious, this of course includes women as well. This is the 
nomenclature that Kierkegaard used, so I'm just being consistent with that. But this, of course, covers both men and women. I believe that he's applying this to Christians here. Some move or even look in the direction of truth so that they might even see a glimpse of it. Uh, but they fail to take the steps necessary to actually walk towards the truth. This is the Christian who's satisfied at knowing that he's a sinner and only wants to be forgiven for his sins. He has no intention of taking his faith any more seriously. He can live with the idea of being a generic Christian, which of course is the most common. It overlooks the fact that the majority of men do never really manage in their whole life to be more than they were in childhood and youth, namely immediacy and the addition of a little dose of self-reflection. Now Kierkegaard seems to hit our culture right between the eyes here. Many men simply remain to be boys, and again, this probably works for women as well, who remain little girls or teenage girls. They're satisfied with playing video games rather than improving their minds and lives. They're all obsessed with their toys and do whatever they need to in order to get the latest toy. These toys are nothing more than mere distractions. They remain children in their spiritual life. Many times such men justify themselves by creating a different reality that justifies such play. Perhaps this is uh, reflected in what's called virtual reality today, where the game takes complete control of their reality and, who, and their identity. Uh, they, they become the player of the game and lose their actual reality. We'll end this section here, uh, this part here, part two, and we'll pick up part three with uh, two types or forms of an illusion. So please stay with us uh, in this last and final part. Uh, Kierkegaard will begin to put some of these ideas together and we'll come up with some sort of a, a solution for you here before we get to the end. So please uh, stay with us in part three. Thank you.